Hello class and thank you for joining me today. I am going to be talking to you about chapter 11, families. Um, so if you will turn in your, your books to page 275 um, and I will continue to work through this lecture to page 290 in your textbook. Okay, this is an exciting um, time to be dealing with families. Um, and first of all, we need to realize that we are partners um, with children's family. And that is part of what research and advocacy organizations like the National Association for the Education of Young Children, or NACI, agree that early care and education should be a collaborative effort between parents and early educators. The experts have polled and the results are in that positive parent educator relationships contribute to school success. Now you will hear um, the big buzzword now is school readiness and school readiness obviously when has, is talking about that when four-year-olds enter into kindergarten, they are given, in the state of Kentucky, they are given the Brigantz test. And that Brigantz test determines whether or not our children are actually ready for kindergarten. So <clears throat> the big push is, is that collaboration with parents building that positive relationship and therefore translating into kids are ready for school. So your book begins talking about on page 275 about defining the family. Now I understand that we have the 1950 Leave it to Beaver family um, and that was great for the 1950s but what does the family look like today? The family looks so different. Um, we don't just have a mother, father, and children. Sometimes we have father and we have children. Sometimes we have mother and we have children. Sometimes we have grandparent and children. Sometimes, you know, we have foster parents and children. And those foster parents look so different all the way across the board. So, <clears throat> turning to page 276, you see the types of family structures that you are going to see in your child development centers. And <clears throat> I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I do want you to, to make sure that you read through those because family arrangements and the types of families that we deal with each have their own need. And you need to become an expert on the different types of resources that these families are going to need. And you know, we, we, we feel so sorry for single parents, single mothers, but what about single dads? <coughs> Everybody seems to forget those people. And what about these foster moms and foster dads, you know? Yes, granted, they are doing this because they want to and they do get a stipend on a monthly basis for taking care of those kids. But, you know, sometimes those foster parents have such a huge heart, you know, to make sure that these children are well taken care of. And I have been so blessed in the last two years at at our center that we have in Lawrenceburg where these foster parents are coming in and their hearts are just poured out and you 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 know you you people are quick to say oh but they get paid to do that well you know they do get paid um, it is probably not a lot per hour for what they deal with and what they do for their children and but the thing about it is, is those foster parents never know when they go to court whether that child is going to be with them after court or 
whatever. Now, sometimes they do have a heads up on that, but the emotional investment that they place in those children is unbelievable. Um, so do not take foster parents for granted. Do not take single mothers for granted. Don't take single dads for granted. And you are, sometimes you have to learn how to be a mediator between that divorced mom and that divorced dad because they just do not have the role model maybe in their life to, to mediate the situation. And sometimes, you know, we as caregivers, we have to step in the middle of that and actually begin to role model some really positive behaviors for them. So your book goes right in chapter. It talks about the different types of families. It starts talking about how culture truly impacts those family dynamics. And what's so amazing here is that we know that when we build those family relationships, that those cultures become extremely important in the lives of those children. Now, where I believe we get messed up as early care educators is we try to get them to bring or take on our culture. No. And it's not right for you to take on their culture and totally integrate that into the classroom. What happens is, is that we need to become a melting pot of cultures in our classroom where every child is valued for being who they are and every parent is valued for being who they are and respected that's the key to having the impact okay and strengthening that family we're going to on my next lecture in um section 11 is about strengthening families and the strengthening family initiative that we have in Kentucky and I'm going to be talking a whole lot about that issue so look forward to that lecture because it's going to be really really good for you but here I want you to understand that part of the things that we need to see in your classroom is that each family's relationship their communication style, their expectations for their children's learning, and in their behavior. That's important because when you deal with Indian behavior, not Native American, but Indian from India, then you have a different expectation for behavior. And a lot of times the Hispanic population has a different expectation on behavior. A whole lot different from probably the Mandarin Chinese um, to American. So we have these different roles that are very unique, the different expectations the families have, and we need to be very respectful of those experiences and those cultural beliefs. Okay, for example, some cultures do not value independence and feel that giving a child too much responsibility is not appropriate. Or some families deem it appropriate to punish or spank their children, which may be harmful to the children and against in a public setting. So you have you have the religious part that's coming into play, you have the social part that's coming into play with culture, and they have to intermingle. Now I'm not saying that your center has to just totally in, in, embellish everything that that culture of that child says, but you do need to be respectful of that, okay? So although some families' cultural practices may not comply with your settings policies, work to respect, work to build that trusting relationship with your families. 
listen to the parents' concerns, and respectfully discuss the policies that we have in place in our child development centers. So just because it's culturally appropriate for them doesn't mean that we break regulations, okay? There's a fine line there. We have to abide by our state regulatory regulations, okay? And for what is best practice in our centers. So page 279 begins to talk to you about establishing these families as partners. And how do you do that? Well, all partners stem from positive relationships and they require us to do certain things. The first thing that, that is needed is that we need to regard each other as equal and we need to contribute to the partnership in different ways. And what I mean is, is that you cannot think of yourself more highly than that parent. You need to place yourself on the same equal level and you need to respect them and value them. There is a difference between valuing somebody and respecting somebody. I can respect you by keeping my mouth closed and be saying yes ma'am and no ma'am. But in my heart, if I do not value you as a person, then my respectfulness is only outward. So there has to be a change in our heart to begin to value a person for who they are. To be to know that person by name, to call them by name, and not by, oh, that's the fat Asian lady. That's not valuing that person, and it's not respecting that person. But if I said, oh, that's Miss Joy and she is from Asia, then I am actually respecting her, okay? And then in my heart, if I truly go out of my way to open the door for Miss Joy and to ask her how she is doing and how can I help her, then my value comes into play for her. I'm actually placing my heart into that. That does not mean that I have to agree with everything that Joy believes in or everything that Joy does, but Joy is a person to me, and I know what she's going through. And when she walks into the center and she is stressed out, then I know that I need to place my hand on her hand and maybe give her a pat or a nice pat on the shoulder that says, do you need something? Would you like for me, do you, do you have time to talk to me? Um, may I help you with something? That is actually placing value into that person. And so the next step your book talks about is learning to listen and learning to talk to that person. When you open yourself up and you have a two-way conversation, and that's what communication is, is that I talk, you listen, you talk, I listen. That is two-way conversation. And we listen and talk to each other. We make an effort to understand each other and where each other is coming from. And we trust each other's points of view. And we agree to disagree respectfully. And a lot of times I, I will say to parents, how do you feel when I say this to you? And the parent may respond back to me, well, I disagree with you, Miss Maria. I don't believe that. And I say, that's fine. I am perfectly okay with you disagreeing with my opinion. Everybody has the right to have an opinion. And when we respect that opinion, then that is respecting diversity 
respecting cultural. Okay? And again, that does not mean we agree. I cannot point that out enough. Everybody gets confused when we begin to talk about, oh, you have to have diversity and you need to accept this. It's okay to say I disagree with that, but I'm going to respect you and I'm going to value you because you are a human being. So we confer with each other when we are making important decisions. And this is the most critical key component that I can stress to you with dealing with families is that you have to respect them and give them the option to make choices about their children. They are the parent. And we must respect them as the parents. Parents may be anxious. They may not have the knowledge that you have as a skilled child care provider. Or when I say parent, I'm talking I, that could be guardian, okay? So you have got to build that relationship where you can approach them and begin to talk to them and they respect your opinion. But if you're constantly pushing your opinion on them, you are not giving them the option to communicate back to you. And again, I want to emphasize that communication is a two-way street. So if you can dish it out, then you need to sit back and ask the parent to feed back to you. Your ability to articulate the importance of what you do is extremely important. You need to be able, as you're learning concepts in this class, you need to be able to take those concepts and begin to articulate them back to parents because you are not just educating children you are actually educating parents and guardians now one of the things that I get you in your homework consistently all the time is I say apply your knowledge how many times have I said that to you how many points have I taken off of your assignments because you're not articulating your knowledge. You're not articulating policies and regs. You're not articulating developmentally appropriate practices. You're only accepting, a lot of you in your assignments are only accepting what you're seeing that teacher do and not critically analyzing what they do. That's because you need to know what good practice is and you need to be able to articulate that. And if you can do that, then I know you know your content. And I know you're learning in my class. It is important for you to understand that you articulate and you articulate in good practice. Children will transition from your setting if, in fact, you have a strong relationship with your families. They will transition more easily because the parents listen and they will understand how to clearly gain the expectations that is needed to help those children move from your class to the next class or from your transitional center to a kindergarten center. So we have to initiate those partnerships so that that transition is smooth and it's ongoing. So your book begins to give you some great um, things that you need to have. If you'll look on page 281, they have actually used those shoe um, holders that you can buy at the dollar store 
so cheaply and look at those pouches that they have created for those families. You can actually do this as an easy brochure um, pockets to put brochures in. How cheap is that? And how wonderful it is to have a family resource right there in your center. I hope when I get to have the chance to come into your center and see you, I hope I see that. I would be so excited, and I hope you name it after me. This is Miss Maria's little idea. Oh, just kidding. Okay, so <clears throat> we are going to encourage family participation. That's part of uh, what we are to do. Look at page 285 on that. Uh, the reason I'm going to point this out is that in your stars, in your eckers, in your itters, in your sakers, in your facers, we have to see family engagements. And so we need to encourage family participation. Um, and you will see that um, in Head Start centers. You're going to see it in all these places that scaffold that parent um, participation. And they encourage it because they want it to happen because they know that if they get those parents involved, oh, it's going to be exciting. And it's not only going to be exciting for the children to see their families interacting with, with their teachers, but it's going to be wonderful that, that those parents begin to interact with the kids and they take and want to be a part of what you're teaching them. So they take it home and they began to act as teachers because you have modeled such good things in front of them. So <clears throat> encourage that, okay? Encourage communication with your families. Encourage that partnership. Um, begin to talk to, to those parents about um, <clears throat> where their kids are in assessment. Show them their work. And I know it's so discouraging when you send at home papers every day and the parent just wads them up and throws them in the trash can. I understand that. I do. It's heartbreaking. I've sat there and wrote my little papers out, handwritten them, and they just throw them away or disregard. I understand that. Or you give them a note and say your child needs diapers and they forget. And it's all that. But you have to realize that parents are busy, just like you're busy. And a lot of times it just seems overwhelming to be a parent. Your book does such a nice job talking about families. Make sure that you read Chapter 11 because there's a lot of golden nuggets in your textbook. I'm not going to, um, I don't want to use the bore bore you with them. I think I have talked about some very important things in our lecture today and I hope that you take those and you just begin to, that when that parent walks in tomorrow into your classroom that you just smile at them and that you realize that they are your partner and that you need to build that relationship with them because they are so important. And if you love that child that you're taking care of, build that relationship with that parent because that is going to enhance everything you do. Have a great day.